Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought I'd follow up from my last video and share with you some of the things that I'm doing to test the imaging train, the rebuilt C925 imaging train with the focal reducer, and also throw in a little bit of a comparison between two RGB filters that help with light pollution, the Optolong L-Pro, which many of you have heard about, many of you have, and the Antlia Tri-Band RGB Ultra Filter, which I was not aware of, but uh, because I have been using Antlia filters and do like what I've been getting out of them, I uh, looked this one up, and sure enough, I bought it and thought I'd give it a test and compare it to the L-Pro. Let's get started. There are a lot of things you have to do when you change your imaging train on the telescope. So in this case, I'm using my SCT, but instead of using it at its native focal length, I'm putting in the focal reducer and that changes everything. One of the first things that you have to do is find stars again. The L-Pro filter lets in more light. So I'm using it to start off with just to give myself a better chance of seeing stars and being able to focus on them. The second thing you want to do is confirm your plate solving parameters and make sure that works because if you don't get plate solving right, not much happens good in an imaging session. And then I want to get the actual focal length from the plate solution so that I can update PhD2, Nina, and Stellarium with the actual focal length of the SCT with the focal reducer installed. And then run L-Pro autofocus on the Beehive cluster. Beehive cluster makes some sense because it's got quite a few stars and it's in a good position for me at this time of year to use as a focusing target. Let me show you what that looks like in a highly sped up mode. So I'm gonna find a nice bright star to zoom in on to do some initial focusing with the Batonoff mask. And once I get there, we'll put the mask on and I'll just adjust things by hand here. I'm not trying to be real precise. I just want to get it to a good starting point for the autofocus run that I'll do with the L-Pro filter. And that looks pretty good right there. Just make a little adjustment and then go back over and find the beehive cluster. And we'll do the autofocus run with some change of parameters. Just a few things on the parameter sets and then run the autofocus and everything works out just great with the L-Pro filter and the Beehive cluster. If you have an off-axis guider, that basically doubles the amount of work it takes to get an optical system up and running because you can't make a change to the optical system and back focus and whatnot without also having to refocus your guide camera and also recalibrate PhD2 for tracking. So here's what that looks like as I'm going outside to manually adjust the focus of the guide star with the telescope pointed at a bright star. Obviously very sped up. I just want to get it down to a pinpoint. Then we'll go over to the meridian and do a calibration. And you can see it's running through the calibration here. And we get a pretty decent calibration curve after this. And we're good to go. So at this stage, I can plate solve an image and I can also perform guiding. So now it's time to zip over to the Leo triplet and perform a series of exposure tests with both filters, the L-Pro and the Antlia tri-band filters to try and determine what my optimum exposure time will be for each one of these filters. I also want to confirm the orientation of my camera to make sure that the Leo triplet is fitting in the field of view as I intended it to. And then after I finished the exposure test, I slew over to M101 now with the Antlia tri-band filter installed and run an autofocus on that with that filter on M101. And what the heck, while I'm out there, I might as well get as many images as I possibly can. Here's what the cloud cam looked like during the Leo triplet exposure testing and the M101 imaging. So I'm starting out with the scope focused on the Leo triplet. And I'm going to just do, perform a series of exposure tests about a couple of hours. And then I switch over to M101. And no sooner than I get to M101 that the clouds realize that I'm doing imaging and come in and pretty much obscure everything. Although I still did get some data. So these are all the objectives I have to meet before I'll be ready for the next imaging window. One of the first thing I did before going out was to take a series of flats. And here's what the Antlia Tri-Band RGB Ultra flat looks like. This is the master flat. I've got the contours, use the PixInsight flat image contour script to uh, do this work here, which you can see is a pretty nice contour. Uh, this is not vignetting. It's just the light level falls off, as you can see with these contours. So I'm not really getting vignetting. However, I am getting some compression of the contours here because of the upstream effect of my off-axis guider, which is kind of off at about a 10 degree angle here relative to uh, the uh, the vertical here of the, through the imaging camera. 
and flats will compensate for this effect. Now, one of the things that I want to do, especially now that I've got this filter drawer and I'm a little bit concerned about the precision with which you can take a filter out, put another filter back in, take that one out, go back to the original filter. What effect does that have on your flats? I've seen an effect with my filter wheel where the wheel doesn't go back to the same position each time for a given filter. I can get kind of an embossed effect because of the slight image shift with that filter, not quite in the same position. After I finished getting all the flats for a master flat with the Antlia Drive Band, I took it out and put in the L-Pro, took a number of flats with that to get a master flat for it, and then went back to the Antlia Drive Band and created a second master flat, having now replaced the tri band back into the filter drawer. And here's what I got when I tried to calibrate the first master flat with the second. Lots of embossed little features here. So the precision of putting in this filter drawer, replacing it, putting the filter back in will likely produce some image artifacts. So one of the things that I'm probably going to be doing while I'm using this system like this is try to avoid swapping out filters to the extent possible. Otherwise, I'm going to be taking flats after every time I replace a filter. Here's the Optolong L-Pro filter. It comes in a nice little plastic case. There's a foam insert here that's recessed, so it's got a circular divot cut out of here, and the filter just sits down in here. The, the lid locks down here. It's just a plastic case, but it works well. L-Pro gives you this uh, transmission curve here, and you can see there are a number of pass bands and stop bands. So you have a pass band here, a stop band, a broader pass band, and so on. We'll take a look, a closer look at this in just a second. But it, I'm pleased to see that Optolong does provide the filter documentation, and I hope it is an accurate representation of this particular filter that, that I have. And, of course, you get the same thing with Antlia. You get their transmission curve for this filter, and I hope it's, again, for this particular filter. One thing you want to be careful of with the Antlia filters and these, these mounted Antlia filters here, when I took this out of the box, the lid, which is, is a thin plastic, looks just like this case here, and it has these four magnets that made up with the four magnets in the bottom of the case here, and that's supposed to hold the lid on. Well, you can probably get a sense of it here with the filter sitting on top of this foam pad. It's sitting up well above the edge of this case here. And when you take the filter out of the box that it comes in, the lid, the filter, and the bottom of the box are all separate items. They're not connected at all. So it's not a sealed item. So be careful when you take the filter out of the box here because you you may find your filter falling on the floor. And here's the transmission curve of the Optolong filter laid over a light spectrum. So you kind of get a sense of where, what color of light is coming in where with the L-Pro. There are a number of stop bands in here. The intent is to cut out light that's best associated, typically associated with light pollution sources. And that's why it gives you a bit of protection against light pollution. It's got quite a bit of light coming through overall. And when I did the testing, I looked at exposure times at 50 seconds, 100 seconds, 200, 300, and 400 seconds. And I took three images at each exposure time. So one of the main objectives of these exposure tests is to figure out how long of an exposure do I need to make sure that I'm sufficiently far off this dark end here? And you can see at 50 seconds, I've got a pretty good gap there. Now, when you go to a 200 second exposure, you get these three curves. So the red jumps out to here, the blue out to here, the green here. And now you've got quite a bit of, of extra space here, probably more than you'd want. And then finally at 400 seconds here, it's getting way out there. So clearly the L-Pro is letting in quite a bit of light, which is a good thing. It's providing some light pollution, but uh, you would, in this case, looks like a 50 second exposure would be appropriate. With the Antlia, there's quite a bit more light pollution protection. A lot of the moon glow comes in in this area and the green yellow area of the spectrum. And so maybe lopping off these two elements here in the Antlia tri-band filter will give me a little bit more pr protection against moon reflection. Uh, but other than that, you can see that there's quite a bit more light coming in from the L-Pro than there is for the Antlia tri-band RGB filter. And indeed, when I performed the exposure test, and in this case, I knew I was dealing with a darker filter, so I started at 100 seconds, then did 200, 300, 400, and 500 second exposures three images each. Here's a comparison of several of those exposure tests. You can see with the 
100 second exposure, I am very close to the edge, probably a little too close for, for my comfort level. And the next set of three peaks here is for the 300 second exposure and then the 500 second exposure. So I can get away with a lot longer exposures using the Antlia Tri-Band RGB filter than I can with the L-Pro. And in fact, I do finally settle on with the L-Pro. I can use the 50 second exposure time with the Antlia RGB filter. I can use a 200 second exposure and that gets me an equal distance from the dark end of the color spectrum, which in turn will help me to make optimum use of my dynamic range for this camera and prevent overexposing some stars on the bright end of the spectrum. Another thing to look at here with the L-Pro you, the brightest color is the green, so as a result, your subs coming out will generally have a kind of a green cast to them. Whereas with the Antlia filter, blue is the brightest color, and so your subs produced by the Tradband filter will have kind of a bluish cast to them. Verifying the autofocus parameters is a critical thing to do when you're changing your imaging system. And here you can see a, couple, a comparison of the autofocus I got with the L-Pro on the Beehive cluster and for the Antlia tri-band filter on M101. Now, in this case, the L-Pro filter gave me a 0.99 R-squared value, which means it's a very good fit to the hyperbolic curve. But of course, the L-Pro is a brighter filter, lets in more light. I'm focusing on a target that has many stars and I'm using a fairly short exposure time of four seconds. With the tri-band, I know that I'm dealing with a darker filter, so I up the exposure time to eight seconds. But since I'm focusing on M101, I've got a lot fewer stars than we do here in the Beehive cluster, so that is gonna cut down on the quality of the focus. Fewer stars, longer exposure, and indeed, I do get a 0.95, still very good, but I think there are some things that I wanna do to improve this. I want to go further out on the focuser position so that I can get this number, the out of focus half flux radius up to about three times what this value is here. In other words, about a nine. And that way I'll get a better definition of the hyperbolic curve. The second thing that I have played with recently is cutting, down, cutting this down to at least six seconds and increasing the gain a bit. And I have, in fact, been seeing R-squared values with the tri-band filter around one, uh, more or less consistently with some of the recent focusing I've been doing. The Leo triplet will only fit in the field of view of this camera if the camera is oriented properly. The way I do orientation is using a digital angle gauge here. I put in a USB drive into the empty USB slot on the back of the camera. This flat surface of the USB drive is nice and wide for this particular USB drive, but it also this the surface is also parallel with the writing on the camera, which also means it's parallel with the long dimension of the sensor. And of course, I can just set my digital angle gauge up on that little shelf and rotate the camera with the other hand until I get within about a degree of where it is that I think I need to be based on some framing I'm doing in Stellarium. When I get the first image of the Leo triplet, I can do a plate solve within Pix Insight and pull out what the orientation is. Now, the thing to keep in mind is these orientation angles coming from Pix Insight are 180 degrees off from what they are from Stellarium. I think Stellarium and Nina use the same convention but the PixInsight image solver script is about 180 degrees different from that. If you've used the PixInsight image solver script, you know it can be kind of picky. There's a couple of things you gotta make sure you do when you use a script in order to get it to solve an image. One of the things is if you're solving an image that doesn't have the date when the image was taken in it, for example, you create a clone and the clone doesn't copy over the fits header information, then what you want to make sure you do in the date of the exposure, the date, the time that the, the subframe was taken, you don't have to be precise about the month and the day, but at least update the year because it's going to default to year 2000. Update to the current year or the year you took the image so that the change of coordinates associated with precession of the Earth does not create too much error for the solver algorithm to find the uh, a pattern of stars that will match. The second thing, and this is particularly true when you go into 
long focal length systems, go into the advanced parameters and go down to detection scales. What I've done here is to up the detection scale from a default of five up to seven, and I've increased the minimum structure size from zero, the default, up to one. And then with these parameters, it will find stars and solve the image with much greater reliability. Another thing that comes out of this image solution is the focal length. And I get 13, 18 millimeters for my C925 with the focal reducer installed. This is the same number I was getting when I was using my DSLR and 105 millimeters of back focus. It is not the 1480 millimeters you would expect with a focal reducer that says it's a 0.63 focal reducer, but you don't get 0.63 out of the focal reducer with the C925. Instead, I'm getting something more like 0.57. So I'm operating at a focal ratio of 5.7 with this scope, but it's important to pull out the actual focal length so that you can put it into PhD2, put it into Nina, and put it into Stellarium. Because the one thing you want to be able to do when you're framing your targets and planning for an imaging session is to make sure that the field of view you see in Stellarium is the field of view that you get when you're out actually taking images. Okay, let's go over to PixInsight and compare the image we have for the two filters we were using. So here we have the Leo triplet. On the left, we have the L Pro version at 52 minutes of integration time. And on the right, we have the Antlia tri-band RGB filter, also 52 minutes. There's nothing that jumps out at you as clearly showing which filter is better or worse. They look pretty good. They both give good images. And frankly, uh, I was very happy that after only 52 minutes, this is the kind of image I'm getting. I usually spend 20 hours of imaging time on Galaxy targets. The only thing I've done to these two images is do the 52 minute stack and perform a dynamic background extraction. Let's zoom in on one of these galaxies here that has some detail to it and compare the two close up. And we'll create the same view over here with the Antlia filters so that we can see them up close. Now, again, they're very similar. I think I'm seeing a bit more contrast in the Antlia image than I am in the Optolong image. Another thing that jumps out at me is, and it's really hard to tell, particularly for you guys, but I think I'm seeing a bit more red in this image than I am over here with the Optolong filter. Now let's apply a little bit more processing to the Antlia filter results and see what we can come up with for our 52 minutes of investment here. Same image, in this case I've included all the data, which means 68 minutes from my Antlia tri-band. I've done a dynamic background extraction over here. I've done a the same source data, but I've applied a color calibration. I've used Bore Exterminator to perform the deconvolution. And I've also done a little bit of noise exterminator to cut down on some of the noise. And now you can really see some detail coming out of this image here. Some of this fuzzy stuff in here is now getting resolved much better. I can see some detail in and around the core of the galaxy. I can actually see these areas where these red nodules are, are areas where there would be HA in this galaxy. So I'm already pulling out some HA into this, out of this galaxy without having to use an HA specific filter. But mostly I'm pretty impressed with the kind of detail I'm getting after the Bore Exterminator treatment and only in this case, a little over an hour of data to work with. Now let's take a look at M101. Here I tried to do some imaging. Now, as you saw in that video, we had a clouds came in almost immediately after I slewed over to M101. I haven't taken out any of the data. I just stacked it all. So some of the effects of those clouds is going to mute some of the contrast, some of the colors in the picture here, but it only amounts to about two and a half hours before I finally had to shut things down for the night. Still, I got an image and I'm pretty pleased with the image I got after only two hours. Let's go to a one-to-one -one image scale and look at what the detail looks like with just a DBE image and after applying some of the blur exterminator. You can certainly see some of the detail coming out. The dust lanes are a bit better resolved here. There's better resolution in, in and around the core, so things are looking much better with the Bore Exterminator. The thing that I think I'm maybe most impressed with the Antlia filter is I'm getting actually pretty good representation of the hydrogen alpha in this galaxy without having to use a hydrogen alpha filter. I've got the focal reducer in place, and I want to see how the stars are doing in the corner of the image. So let's go in a little bit more and go up to a corner of the image. And here the story is not as positive. I have a, well, 
triangular shaped star, but there seems to be a stretch more or less in the circumferential direction in the upper left hand corner. If we go down to the lower right hand, arguably there's that triangle effect and maybe a bit of stretch again in the circumferential direction if you squint hard enough. And down here, it's hard to find a star. But again, I'd say we have a bit of a circumferential stretch to the star down in the lower right. And then finally, in the upper right, again, we have kind of a stretch in the circumferential direction. So what that's saying is that we need to reduce the back focus. The problem with this is that my train has not got a lot of fat in it. And I'm not sure how much effort I would put into trying to improve the stars in, this, in the corners here. They're not that noticeable when you look at the image as a whole. Also, when you figure you're doing galaxy imaging, you're going to have situations like this or worse, meaning the galaxy is going to be even smaller. And so it doesn't hurt to just crop out around the boundary of the image to get rid of the most offending stars. All in all, I'm pretty pleased with the handful of results that I got from that first night of playing around. I achieved all of my first night imaging training objectives from focusing to guiding and demonstrating that the autofocus routine works like a champ, and so does plate solving. So I'm pretty much ready to go now for real imaging. I would say the Optolong L-Pro and the Antlia Tri-Band provide pretty similar images. I don't think there's any one reason to definitely pick one filter over the other. I do find that I have to use shorter exposures with the L-Pro. It lets in a lot more light than the Tri-Band, so I'm getting more light pollution and perhaps more moon glow protection out of the Antlia filter. And I can use a 200 second exposure with the tri-band, which cuts down on the number of images that I have to deal with and also protects me against the effect of read noise by taking longer exposures. Based on the very limited amount of data I have right now, what I've looked at, I think I'm preferring or at least leaning towards the Antlia tri-band filter. I seem to get better contrast out of the image and I, see, I seem to get more red, particularly in the HA region. So it's possible that I can do galaxy imaging with just the Antlia tri-band and not have to use the dual band filter that I also bought. We'll talk about that filter later. But I bought a dual band filter thinking I was going to have to get a more narrow band of HA in order to pick it up. But the tri-band filter is doing a pretty darn good job. I did make use of Nina's manual filter wheel option. This lets you add on uh, the filters that you're uh, do using with a filter drawer to the end of the list of the filters you might have with your filter wheel. And then when you select a filter, Nina prompts you to put the filter in. Now, the primary reason for that, for me, is so that the filter name will be incorporated into the file name of the subframes that I get. I like to see what filter it is. So this allows me to do that without having to manually change the name of the subframes. I am going to try to avoid switching filters, and this is where the extra red coming out of the Antlia tri-band is a benefit. If you pull out a filter and replace it later, you're not going to be exactly at the same spot. So you're potentially going to have to take a lot more flats if you start swapping out filters with the filter drawer. The stars are not perfect in the corners with a 105 millimeter back focus and the stock Celestron focal reducer for my C925. It appears that I'm getting some stretch kind of in the circumferential direction, which would suggest that I need to reduce the back focus a bit, but that's not a trivial thing to do. Also with galaxy targets, they're going to tend to be fairly small in the field of view, and that would allow you to crop out those stars. I don't want to make any more changes to this imaging train if I can avoid it. Enough talk, it's time to do some actual real galaxy season imaging. Okay, guys, well, clear skies, and next time I check in with you, hopefully we can talk a little more about some real images collected with the Antlia tri-band filter. Take care, and I'll talk to you guys later.